Okay. Good evening, students. Uh, today we are going to study tradition of English literary criticism. In the previous lectures, we have gone through the Greek and Greco-Roman literary criticism, which was influences or which influencing the English criticism. <clears throat> but you see, from the Elizabethan period, English has its own criticism developed. And from Philip Sidney to John Dryden, and later writers from romantic poetry or romantic period, they have developed their own idea of literary criticism for evaluation of literature and art. So uh, before we move into studying Wordsworth and Coleridge, we need to go through foundation of tradition of English literary criticism, which basically begins from Philip Sidney. So uh, four of the important topics we have to cover in this uh, lecture. First is an apology for poetry by Philip Sidney. Second, an essay of dramatic poesy by Dryden. And then negative capa capability, which is, the, which is concept given by John Keats. And fourth one is pathetic fallacy. So these are the four important topics we have to cover today. So first one is, Philip Sidney's Apology for Poetry. So here, Sir Philip Sidney was born in the year 1554 and died in the year 1586. Is English poet, courtier, diplomat, and soldier. So we need to understand that Philip Sidney was associated with the royal family and a political person. And he was on diplomatic mission to France and Italy. And from there itself, he carried influences upon his uh, creative mind and he started uh, writing uh, poetry. So Arcadia and uh, uh, another important uh, poetry he has written, which are very famous uh, during pre-Elizabethan period. Also, sorry, pre-Shakespearean period. He is an important figure of the English Renaissance, the ideal of the perfect courtier and the universal gentleman. So it was the time when Renaissance was influencing uh, the English uh, art faculty. Renaissance, which was uh, uh, a movement initiated in Europe during uh, 15th century for uh, knowledge, for enhancement of knowledge, and uh, connecting uh, the present uh, civilization with the past classical period. Therefore, that is a kind of all-round influence upon arts and human life was seen during the Renaissance period. So we can see that uh, in England, Sir Philip Sidney is one of the important uh, uh, Renaissance figure. He was the grandson of Duke Northumberland and here to present you to the Earl of Leicester, Warwick. So Philip Sidney was not himself a nobleman. So he was associated with a royal family, not himself a nobleman. His appointment as a governor of Flushing in 1585 received little preferment from Elizabeth. So uh, since I have mentioned that uh, Sir Philip Sidney was associated with the royal family, so he received a favor from Queen Elizabeth for his appointment as a governor in the year 1585, hardly a year before. Sidney did not think of himself as primarily a writer and surprisingly little of his life was devoted to writing. So basically Sidney got a very, a very less life and uh, only few of the uh, poem, Arcadia, Astrophel and Stella, these are the prominent uh, two important poem, uh, poems he has written. <clears throat> and then 
apology for poetry that is important uh, critical document he has produced so within this small uh, you say uh, with this small uh, literary uh, i mean uh, uh, works he cannot uh, identify himself as one of the leading poet of the time during his lifetime sidney's work circulated only in manuscript so we know that it was a time when recently uh, the printing press has initiated but uh, you see some writer they were still uh, circulating their manuscripts and sidney was uh, unable to publish his work during his lifetime so uh, major of uh, all of his major work especially acadia estopel and stella and apology for poetry all uh, these works published uh, after uh, his step so his arcadia was the first to be printed in the year 1590 combining elements drawn from the pastoral tradition the heroic epic and the romances of chivalry this long mixture of prose and verse summed up the heroic ideas that inspired sidney's life so you see this was a time when english writer they were uh going back to the pastoral tradition so life of uh, shepherd and shepherdess life of farmers and rustics so you see this attachment to rustic lives or attachment to the pastoral life was seen uh, during such period uh, drama as well as uh, the contemporary writers and it was continued to be followed during a neo classical period of john dryden and then it was adopted uh, during uh, romantic period as well so writers like wordsworth uh, coleridge and some other junior writers they were striving to uh, make people uh, attract toward this uh, kind of a life so a uh, pastoral setting of poetry was a uh, kind of uh, you see attraction for uh, wordsworth as well so in the poetry so uh, in the criticism of wordsworth he has uh, mainly focused on pastoral tradition and especially language of rustics so you can see that this influence of uh, sydney was continued toward uh, the following ages and uh, uh, wordsworth uh, and uh, coleridge and even the contemporary critics they uh, adopted this idea of pastoral setting in the literature another important poetry written by sidney was astrophel and stella so it was first printed in the year 1591 sidney expressed varying moods and intensities of passionate love in imitation of italian and french sonnets of the petrarchan tradition sidney's simple yet delicate verse is markedly superior to that of his contemporary so these are the two important work uh, creative work uh, written by uh, sydney unfortunately he wasn't able to publish during his life but these poems continue to influence the following ages his an apology for poetry first published in the year 1595 posthumously it was the first major critical essay in renaissance england this critical essay perhaps more than any other work had assured sydney's position in the history of literature because before sydney we haven't seen any critical document ever written by english writers and this was the reason why you see whenever you think of literary criticism and tradition of literary criticism in england so we have to uh, initiate or begin with uh, an apology for poetry by uh, philip sydney An apology for poetry is one of the most important contributions to literary theory written in England during the Renaissance. Philip Sidney's influence can be seen throughout the subsequent history of English literary criticism. Sidney's influence on future critics and poets relates more closely to his views of place of poetry in society. Sidney's doctrine presents the poet as creator, the poet's mediating role between two worlds. transcendent forms and the historical uh sidney's difference was a significant contribution to the genre of 
literary criticism. An apology for poetry is known for the defense of poetry. So here, defense is word itself sufficient to understand that. <coughs> understand that he is going to defend the English uh, critical tradition. An apology for or defense of the art of poetry. Image of poetry was declined in the early Elizabethan period and disrespected by critics. So in the in the beginning uh, part of uh, the Elizabethan period, we see so literary literature uh, literary creation was not uh, appreciated. It was devalued, and there are many reasons for that because it was initially imitated literature from French, Italian, and German, and this was the reason why uh, the originality was questioned. Uh, Gosen was a Puritan and his school of abuse was a polemical pamphlet claiming that poets lead people astray and preach immortality. Now we need to go back to uh, Plato, where Plato who found, uh, you see, uh, poets are uh, immoral and uh, he banished poets from his kingdom. So earliest uh, critical, uh, you say, uh, critical thinkers of England, they were highly influenced of either Aristotle or Plato. And therefore, there was a school existent in the England that is Gozun. Gozun was a Puritan. So they were Puritan and they were following ideas of Plato. And therefore, they found the contemporary poet, they were also not uh, I mean, suitable to the literature. So here you see, uh, Sydney's stand was obviously to defend the English poetry. Although we, we, we see that from Chaucer uh, to uh, the pre-Elizabethan writers like uh, uh, Earl of Surrey and uh, Thomas Watt, they were high uh, with their art, I mean, imitating and creating English poetry. So by combining the liveliness of history with the ethical focus of philosophy is more effective than either history or philosophy in the rousing its reader to virtue. So an apology for poetry speaks about the role of the poet in society. So here the role of the poet is important because Aristotle is critical of poet's role and uh, he found it is immoral. And there is a tradition which was following uh, Plato's idea. But at the same time, there was Aristotelian, uh, I would say, uh, the tradition is also there who, who is defending the poets. So somehow we can see that Philip Sidney is there to defend the role of poets. So here he maintained all the great civilizations of the world have valued poetry and the work of the poet. So poetry is civilized and civilizing art form. So here uh, defending the poetry, which was, uh, you say, blamed or leveled charges against, against it by the Plato and its tradition in England. So they found uh, the poetry is uh, the form which was practiced by immoral uh, poets. And this was the reason why Sidney came forward and he maintained poetry is civilized and civilizing the art form. Poetry can bring you closer to God. So here, uh, he is, uh, I mean, Sidney is spiritualizing the ideas of poetry and he is connecting the poet and the creative work to the God. So he maintained if God is our maker, the poet is a kind of a maker too, because he is a creative. Poetry is an art of imitation, he maintained, like Aristotle. So Aristotle uh, defended the poet and he uh, called or he maintained creativity, imitation is nothing but an uh, creativity. So similarly, uh, Sydney also maintained that uh, it is an art of imitation. Poetry involves metaphor and metaphor is a form of imitation, comparing one thing to another. So metaphor is very important element or device we can see writers uses to uh, give his poem a, a superb meaning. The poetry is then a speaking picture whose aim is to teach and delight. So here in poetry, writer brings images and images are very lively and can uh, convey a meaning. 
So this is the reason why he maintained a speak poem is a speaking picture whose aim is to teach and delight. So again, we are going back to Aristotle where he is talking about uh, the pity and fear, the emotion of pity and fear. And there also he talks about the entertain entertainment quality and the pleasure out of literature. So obviously reader is at the focus. Sydney is same in the uh, boat as sailed uh, by Aristotle. Here Sydney maintained nature never set forth the earth in so rich tapestry as diverse poet have done, neither with so pleasant rivers, fruitful trees, sweet smelling flowers, nor whatsoever else may make the too much love earth more lo lovely. A world is brazen, the poets only deliver a golden. So in this way, here, uh, Sydney is comparing uh, the poet as a diverse, and he is, the one who delivers a golden. The poet has the advantage over the philosopher because the philosopher teacheth, but teacheth obscurely because philosophy for Sydney is obscure. So as the learned only can understand him. So to understand philosophy, one has to be learned. One has, uh, one has to uh, understand the knowledge. But whereas he teaches them that are already taught, so here, you see, uh, the philosophy is for those who are learned and it is already for those who are taught. But in case of uh, poetry, it is democratic. Poetry is a democratic art, ac accessible to those who are untutored in philosophy. So even you are not uh, into philosophy, you are unable to understand philosophy, no matter, but one can understand poetry. And poetic drama is perhaps the most democratic uh, at all. Okay, so here you see, Sydney uh, defended the poetic drama. Poetry requires a reader and reader needs to have been taught to read. So those who are illiterate are still shut out from it. So here, it is very important uh, to understand poetry, one has to be a literate one. Okay, poetry requires reader and readers need to have been taught to read. But drama bypasses the need for the audience to be literate. All that drama requires is a spectator rather than reader. But in case of drama, you don't require to be literate you uh, without literacy also you can understand drama so this is the quality of drama next uh, writer in sequence is john dryden after philip sydney we are now uh, moving into the another uh, i mean uh, critical writer john dryden although john dryden is known for his uh, satires and uh, you say uh, drama, but at the same time, uh, he is also known for literary criticism. He was the first poet laureate of England and influences the restoration period. He was the son of parliamentary supporters, but exhibited royalist sympathies early. So you see uh, the family, uh, they supported Oliver Cromwell who toppled the English, uh, you say, dynasty, and uh, there was uh, a rule of, you say, parliament from 1648 till 1660. But by Charles II, the king, uh, the king's throne was restored, and from there, you say, restoration period was counted. After Shakespeare, he wrote the greatest heroic plays of the century. The Conquest of uh, Grenada, written in 1670 and 71, and the greatest tragic comedy, The Marriage a la Mode, written in 1671. And he wrote the greatest tragedy of the restoration, All for Love, in the year 1677. Then the greatest uh, tragic comedy, Don Sebastian, and one of the greatest comedies, Amphitryon. 
So you see, after Shakespeare, Dryden was the one who imitated Shakespeare in all the forms, tragedy, tragic comedy, uh, and then comedy. He was evidently weary of the chaos and disorder that followed upon Cromwell's death, for in the 1660, he welcomed the king with his poem as, uh, as Tria Redux. So as I have just mentioned, his family was follower of parliamentary rule. So obviously they were appreciating uh, the Oliver Cromwell's rule. But by 1660, after the death of Oliver Cromwell, the chaos visited uh, the England and Cromwell's son was unable to handle the power. So within two years from 1658 to, uh, sorry, 1658 to 1660, within these two years, you see people felt need of uh, you say restoration of Charles II. So here, very soon we see uh, those who back uh, Charles II, Trident, one, one, uh, Trident was one of them. He produced the first great satire in verse, Absalom and Apitopol. Through this satire, Dryden exposed the relations of Manmouth, the prince, and Shaftesbury, the evil counselor. He established the heroic couplet as a standard form of English poetry by writing successful satires and religious pieces. In the year 1680s, Dryden converted to Catholicism and set to work criticizing the Anglican Church, which ultimately lost him the position of poet laureate. So you see, by the time uh, Charles II uh, restored, Charles II basically, uh, basically was Protestant follower. But since he was not having legal hair, he wanted his brother James II to, to be uh, accepted as the next heir to the throne. But James I was the Catholic follower, and this was the reason why English Parliament wa I mean, wasn't I mean, giving permission for uh, uh, the accession of James I. And there was a Cold War was going on between Parliament and Charles II and obviously James I. So poet uh, Dryden was the one who supported Charles II in case of bringing James I as the next heir. And he himself was also converted to the Catholicism. But because of his Catholic beliefs, he has to lose his important position, poet laureate. Now, turning toward an essay of dramatic poesy. So, dramatic poesy was probably written in the year 1666 during the closure of the London theatres due to plague. So, you see, the first time uh, theatres were closed during 1642 uh, when King Charles II, I mean, accused uh, drama for uh, immoral uh, or obscenity in it. But later on, due to plague also, uh, theaters were shut down. And then writer has uh, ample space to uh, discuss and think over the critical treatise. So here, this book deals with the views of major critics and taste of men and women of the time of Triton. So here, the scheme of the work is a discussion between four friends having four different views related to literature. So it can be taken as a general defense of a drama as a legitimate art form. In the late 17th, 17th century, Shakespeare was severely criticized for the mixing of genres. It was Dryden who elevated Shakespeare to the height for his natural genius. So you see, one of the important contemporary uh, to Shakespeare was Ben Johnson. And he was a very serious critic to Shakespeare in case of maintaining that Shakespeare was an artistic failure because he was the follower of a shortly and tradition and according to the three dramatic unities and uh, critical understanding given by Aristotle, which was highly violated by uh, Shakespeare. And this was the reason why you, you see there was a tradition of Ben Johnson and followers, those who take uh, those who criticize Shakespearean experiments. But here, Dryden was the one, not only he imitated Shakespeare, 
by producing tragedy, tragic comedies, and comedies on the line of Shakespeare. But at the same time, he defended Shakespeare during the restoration period. So the essay is structured as a dialogue among the four friends of the river Thames. The four gentlemen, Eugenius, Titus, Lacidius, and Neander, begin an ionic, witty conversation on the subject of poetry, which soon turns into a debate on the virtues of modern and ancient writers. So here, these four writers are representing the four different views of literature and rhetoric criticism. So here, Critias begins with his argument. Now we maintain none of his contemporaries, that is moderns, can equal the standards and the rules set by ancient Greeks and Romans. So here we can see that the Greek critical tradition and Greco-Roman Roman critical tradition, you know, Horace and Longinus. So Greek tradition was influenced by Plato and Aristotle, and Greco-Roman tradition was influenced by Horace and Horace Walpole and uh, Longinus. So here, Clytus is, uh, you see, uh, somehow was influenced of these uh, classical uh, writers. And he was, when he was uh, looking into the contemporary uh, modern writers of the time, he found they were not following the classical rules. So here, Eugenius restrains him from wasting time on finding demerits. He asked him to find relative merits in Greeks and moderns. So here, uh, Eugenius, uh, I mean, intervened into the discussion and he simply asked him, instead of finding demerits, why not uh, you go into, I mean, relating merits of Greeks and the modern. So Critias, he has favors classical drama and maintain modern dramatists as shadow of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Seneca, and Terence. Now, these are all, uh, I mean, classical poets were, I mean, uh, referred by Aristotle in Poetics. Now, here, Elizabethan dramatist Ben Johnson borrowed from classics and felt proud to call himself modern Horace. So, here, uh, ben Johnson is the writer who was contemporary to Shakespeare and called a rival to him. So he was the follower of this uh, uh, modern, uh, sorry, classic, classical tradition. And he felt proud to call himself modern Horace. The classical is more skillful in language than their successor. Eugenius now is uh, there to make his statement and he somehow favors modern dramatists. He criticizes the faults of classical playwrights. For him, the classical drama is not divided into acts and also lacks the originality. Their tragedies are based on one of myths and comedies are based on overused curiosity of stolen heresies and miraculous restoration. So here, uh, on one hand, we see that Aristotle is upholding uh, the uh, very famous writers like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Seneca, and Terence. But here Eugenius is condemning all these writers for these writers are taking themes from uh, the, uh, the myths, mythology, and therefore uh, they were not original according to Eugenius. He continued further, they disregard poetic justice. Instead of punishing the vice and rewarding the virtue, they have often shown prosperous wickedness and an unhappy devotion. Now, after Eugenius, Lycidius supports the French drama of earlier 17th century. The French dramatists never mix tragedy and comedy. So obviously, when he is maintaining this, he is somehow is critical to Shakespeare, who mixes tragedy and comedy and made tragic comedy, means romance. So here, French writer, according to Lycidius, they do not mix tragedy and comedy. They strictly adhere to the poetic justice reward the virtue and punish the vice. So they prefer emotion over plots. Violent action takes place off stage and are told by messenger rather than showing them in real. So you see, during Shakespearean time, <coughs> or <coughs> Elizabethan theater, some violent themes were being adopted on theater. Like, uh, 
some of the dramas like Macbeth, Shakespeare also brought some violent scene uh, in the action, like uh, the murder of uh, uh, Lady uh, Macduff and her son. That was a very, uh, you see, uh, difficult scene occur in Macbeth. It's a violent scene, you know, the killing act of a child of hardly uh, 10, 11 year old. So in this way, uh, you see, then there is a, a Webster, Duchess of Malfi is entirely a melodrama having full of physical action. So in this way, physical action, bringing physical action on the stage was, a, was again initiated on uh, Elizabethan theater. But here, uh, uh, when we go back to the classical tradition, so all these uh, battle and uh, violent scene were happened off the stage and they were narrated to the chorus. So here, French tradition still upholding the, uh, the primary, sorry, the early 17th century French writers, they, they were still adopting the choruses in the chorus in the drama, whereas uh, Shakespearean tradition has entirely eliminated the chorus and uh, they started introducing physical action on the stage. So here now Neander is there. Now Neander is the one who supports, uh, you see, uh, the English tradition. So Neander is uh, the one, if you can understand, uh, Dryden himself who, de who defends Shakespeare. So here Neander criticizes the view of Lesidius and French drama. He talks about the greatness of Elizabethans. For him, Elizabethans fulfill the drama requirement that is imitation of life. So here Aristotle's main idea is imitation of life, that is creativity. And that creativity is highly been uh, acquired by or adopted by the Elizabethan dramatics. French drama raises perfection, but has no soul or emotion as it primarily focuses on the plot. So the basic focus of French drama was upon uh, the plot, whereas the English drama was focusing upon the character. The tragicomedy is the best form of drama. Both sadness as well as joy are heightened and are set aside by side. Hence, it is closest to life. So here, uh, Shakespeare once maintained human life is neither a comedy entirely nor a uh, tragedy entirely. It is, it is a tragic comedy, you know. So there is a chicken balance. There is, uh, you say, uh, happy moment as well as there are some tragic moments as well. So in this way, uh, Neander, so Dryden here defended the tragic comedy form practiced by or introduced by Shakespeare. He believes that subplots in this drama. This French drama having a single plot lacks the vividness. So you see, uh, even Aristotle condemns the subplot or plot within the plot. But Shakespearean drama always having subplot within the, within the drama. So uh, in Hamlet also we see there is uh, a, a, a drama within the drama like situation is there. In uh, King Lear is also there is a parallel story of uh, Earl of Gloucester is there. So in this way, uh, some of the tragedies of Shakespeare carry subplots, but which was condemned by Aristotle and they were also not in vogue in French drama. But here, Dryden defended uh, this drama within the drama or plot within the, uh, plot within the plot. And here he found French drama having a single plot lacks the vividness. So deviation from set rules and dramatic unities give diverse themes to drama. So it, not, it, it is not the violation of uh, dramatic unities, but it was a diverse theme to the drama. So Neander want, I mean, critics to look into these deviation as again, a creativity, not the violations of rule. So change of place and time do not diminish the dramatic credibility in drama. He also argued that Shakespeare is the man who of all modern and perhaps ancient poets and largest, most comprehensive soul. So here, Francis Dumont and John Fletcher, they were again contemporary uh, dramatists to Shakespeare. So their drama are rich in wit and have smoothness and polish in their language. From Francis Dumont and John Fletcher, drama are rich in wit, have smoothness and polish in their language.
Shakespeare was the Homer or father of our dramatic poets. So if Homer is upheld in Greek tradition, so English will obviously uh, upheld Shakespeare as Homer. Johnson was the virtual and pattern of elaborate writing. I admire him, but I love Shakespeare. So here, Ben Johnson was rival to Shakespeare, but here he was also part of English tradition. And this was the reason why Dryden doesn't deny him. But at the same time, he puts Shakespeare above him. Now we are quite as come back to the discussion and he believes that blank verse as a poetic form nearest to the prose is most suitable for drama. So now discussion is shifted on the, uh, I mean, the, uh, I mean, uh, the diction of the poem. And here Neander defines rhyme as it briefly and clearly explain everything. The boat on which they all were riding reaches its destination. The stairs at Somerset House and the discussion ends without any conclusion being made. So in this way, these are the four friends. They discusses uh, different views of criticism. One supports the Greco-Roman uh, tradition. The other uh, supports the uh, French tradition. And uh, Neander is there to defend the English traditions. Okay, now third important uh, uh, topic is here to discuss that is negative capability. So negative capability is basically an idea introduced by John Pitts through one of his letters. So uh, it was uh, briefly used in a private letter to his brother, George and Thomas on 22nd December, 1870. And here about the artist access to truth without the pressure and framework of logic or science. This is what the idea behind introducing this concept of negative capability. So Coleridge was by 1817, a frequent target of criticism by younger poets of Pitt's generation often ridiculed for it in fatuation with German idealistic philosophy. So you see, during the romantic period, there were two groups of poets were there. One was the senior and another one was the junior one. So senior one mainly were uh, carrying uh, poets like Wordsworth and Coleridge. And in the junior writers, they were uh, Shelley, Keats, and Byron. So here, uh, the junior critic, uh, the junior uh, romantics, they uh, often find faults with Coleridge for his infatuation with German idealistic philosophy. So here, Keats sets up the model of Shakespeare, whose poetry articulated various points of view and never advocated a particular vision of truth. In a letter to J. H. Reynolds in February 1818, he wrote, we hate poetry that has a palpable design upon us. And if we do not agree, seem to put its hand in its breeches pocket, poetry should be great and unobtrusive, a thing which enters into one's soul and does not startle it or amaze it with itself but with its subject. Now here, Keats understood Coleridge as a searching for a single higher order truth or a solution to the mysteries of unnatural world. You see, when you go through the uh, Coleridge poems, so you are selling through the supernatural uh, world. So here, why uh, recurrent uh, recurrent uh, supernatural scene has been introduced in Shakespeare, uh, sorry, Coldry, it's only because he was seeking a truth or solution to the mysteries of the natural world. He went on to find the same fault in Delke and Wordsworth. So here, Keats also found a problem with poem, poets like Delke and Wordsworth. So all these poets he claimed lack objectivity and universality in their views of human condition and the natural world. So many of majority of the poems written by Coleridge and Wordsworth, they were subjective in kind. But here, Keats wanted objectivity in the poetry. Keats supposed that a great thinker like William Shakespeare is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. A poet then has the power to bury self-consciousness. So here, when self-consciousness is quite dominant, so he must be able to bury it. 
dwell in a state of openness to all experiences and identify with the object contemplated. So here, obviously, the kid's idea is to, uh, I mean, uh, check the writer with the objective stand. The inspirational power of beauty, according to kids, is more important than the quest for objective fact. An author possessing negative capability is objective. So here, now, we are coming back to the important point. Now, what is that point? So what is negative capability? It is objective and emotional detachment as opposed to one who writes for didactic purposes. A literary work possessing negative capability may have beauties and depths that make conventional consideration of truth and morality irrelevant. This concept of negative capability is precisely a rejection of set philosophy and preconceived systems of nature. Kids demanded that the poet he receptive rather than searching for fact or reason and do not seek absolute knowledge of every truth, mystery and doubt. Kids here demanded that the poet be receptive rather than searching for fact or reason and to not seek absolute knowledge of every truth, mystery, or doubt. So here, the quest of Wordsworth Coleridge was to go after the truth. And here, kids has different idea. Okay, now, after kids, there is a pathetic fallacy, the idea or the concept given by John Ruskin. So this was the term coined by John Ruskin in the modern painters uh, in the year 1843 to 16. So pathetic fallacy is a literary term for attribution of human emotion and conduct to things found in nature that are not human. The practice is form of personification that is as old as poetry, in which it has always been common to find smiling or dancing flowers, angry or cruel winds, brooding mountains and mocking alls or happy larks. Here, uh, John Ruskin used term to attack the sentimentality that was common to the poetry of late 18th century and which was rampant among poets including Burns, William Blake, Wordsworth, Shelley, and Keats. So here Ruskin considered the excessive use of fallacy, the mark of an inferior poet. Later poets, however, especially the images of the early 20th century, as well as T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound used the pathetic fallacy freely and effectively. Okay, so in this way, today we have discussed these this four important uh, ideas of literary criticism on which uh, uh, the critical tradition of England is based. So after these four important uh, writers and their ideas, we'll now move on to uh, the preface to the lyrical ballad uh, written by Wordsworth. Okay, if you have any question or query, you can ask me or put in uh, the WhatsApp, WhatsApp group. Okay, now we are I'm closing the meeting and we'll meet uh, positively in the another uh, lecture on uh, Wordsworth and Coldridge.